You are listening to Action Design, your monthly insight into the field of behavioral economics and its applications to the world around us. We bring you leading practitioners from all industries to discuss cutting-edge behavioral research and how to practically apply those concepts to the development of consumer products and public policy. Hello and welcome. Thank you all for tuning in to this edition of Action Design Radio. Uh, I'm your co-host, Zarak Khan. With me, as always, Eric Johnson. Hello, everyone. (laughs) And we are both excited and fortunate to have with us today Marielle Beasley, who is the senior researcher at the Center for Advanced Hindsight and also co-director of the Common Sense Lab. Um, Welcome, Marielle. Uh, as Rock mentioned, I am at the Center for Advanced Hindsight, which is a behavioral economics research lab at Duke University for the uh, uh, basically for the for for the average action design uh, listener. You might better know that this as Dan Ariely's research lab, and uh, we basically we here at the center we're we're within Duke University and we do basically behavior research, decision research, uh, specifically in the realms of health decisions and financial decisions. And we do sort of the academic stuff that's, you know, take some undergrads, put them into a room, have them build some Legos, and then auction those Legos off. Uh, and then we also have sort of the side of the lab that that I'm more on, which is uh, great. So we know that the endowment effect exists. Um, how can organizations use things like the endowment effect or you know, the ostrich effect or all of these like wonderfully named uh, behavioral principles, how do we actually use those to kind of help people better align with their goals? And how do we kind of help people live these sort of our, our sort of catchphrase here is these happier, healthier and wealthier lives. And so that's really what I spend most of my time doing is trying to figure out how can a credit union adapt their products and services and, and such to um, basically to, to kind of use those insights to change client behavior. And so, you know, the phrase of like a research lab makes me think like a lot of academics sitting around. Your background is sort of less academic than maybe some of your counterparts. Yes. Uh, so my background is public policy. Uh, as Zarak knows, uh, uh, we studied together uh, at the lovely Sanford School. Um, can, can we get some, uh, if we have some extra time, I want some uh, some college stories about Zarak. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like the time that he told everybody that he had like a whole family at home. And uh, I think for the first like year, I think of school, everybody thought that he was like in his mid 30s and like had two <laughs> that just he never brought out to, to see yep. anybody. Yeah. Wow. Just, a, just a family <laughs> man, you know? I, I wanted everyone to think that I was a responsible guy. <laughs> He's not going out tonight. He's got to go home and take care of his kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's that a nice excuse to get out of stuff. Turns out he's actually like 22 years old. <laughs> <laughs> the, be- the beer shows everybody off. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It did trick us all. Um, but yeah, so, so my background is in public policy, but um, here at the lab, we have sort of a diverse set of folks. We've got, um, we have uh, PhDs in social psychology. We have, um, we actually, we've got uh, postdocs in, we have a postdoc in philosophy um, we have a PhD in experimental economics. Uh, we have, you know, folks that have like just industry experience. So we've got somebody who worked in advertising for nine years, uh, before joining the lab. So it's a really pretty diverse group. Um, because while some of it is sort of the more academic research focused, it turns out that not all academics are really great at talking to practitioners and figuring out sort of win-win situations that's both good for research and good for an organization. Um, and we found that a diverse skill set uh, helps push those projects through a little bit better. So, so yeah. you kind of build that team like as as you go, like as it seems like there's a, a need arises, you look for now we need a PhD philosophy person, or does somebody come to you and sort of pitch something and you're like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. We could then use you in these areas. Uh, that's a great question. And I wish I had a good answer to it. Um, so Dan uh, has... So we've grown really, really rapidly over the last couple of years. So when I first joined the lab, um, there were really only about three of us that were doing applied work, uh, which which is the sort of non-academic track. And um, and since then, that has now grown to 
So the lab as a whole now is about 40 people. And uh, I would say probably 30 of the 40 are now doing the applied side uh, of work. And so that's like a, yeah, so that's like a part of the lab that has really grown a lot. Um, And so Dan, so we've, we've sort of, so everybody kind of has a, a different hiring technique. In some cases, it's, you know, somebody has like approaches the lab who just seems like a really great, interesting person. Um, and we, you know, we generally always have more projects than we have staff for. Um, like we have higher demand for our services than, mm-hmm. than what we can meet, which is a, a wonderful position to be in. Um, and so it basically means that if, if the timing is right and the person seems right, we can, we can usually bring them onto the lab. Right. Um, and so it's, it has been more of a organic growth rather than sort of a targeted strategic, this is the type of person we're looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, yeah, it's actually one of, one of my uh, former colleagues, she's, she's moved on to, to another spot now, but one of my former colleagues, she actually got the job because she was interviewing Dan for a magazine. She was a journalist and was interviewing Dan for a magazine and Dan just felt like they clicked. And so he offered her a job on the spot. Uh, Probably yeah. a good article too. <laughs> I think maybe good interviewing she skills. <laughs> right. I think I think maybe she didn't publish the article because then she felt like it was a con like a conflict of interest right. to be like, right. oh, this is my new boss. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There's also like rumors of other people in the past having gotten hired because like they were at the same pool as Dan, and like, yeah. If you're listening not in, today, please don't like stop Dan and his pool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the takeaway is not try to like, yeah. <laughs> takeaway yeah, is not Dan. find Dan wherever you can and hope you guys click. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's interesting because I'm sure, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, he's obviously one of like the, you know, most prominent people in the field. And um, since it is a relatively new field, especially in the way that you guys do it, which is like the combination of the research and the application, um, do you think, like, you know, him and yourself, the, if you're doing this in that sense, like, do you tend to just get kind of, like, an eye for people that seem to um, really fit? You know, obviously a lot of it's, like, culture fit for the team, too, but uh, just people you can tell. Um, not, are there things that should demonstrate, like, people that are probably going to be capable and, like, do a good job in those things? Um, Outside of the uh, obvious, I guess. So, so I would say that, like, we probably suffer, like anybody else, of this overconfidence bias that, like, yeah. oh, we know how to pick them. We got a good eye for this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I would say that, a, <laughs> uh, I don't have like a great, so we hired somebody, um, not that long ago and, uh, after we had sort of some meetings with her just to kind of see how it jived and, and things like that. Uh, Dan's comment on why he thought we should hire her is because she seems a little weird, but interesting. <laughs> um, interesting. and so like, yeah, so basically like if you kind of fall into that category, is it like you, you seem a little weird but but interesting, um, then you might have a better shot. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so take that into consideration with your wardrobe when you're showing up at the pool that Dan goes to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that for us it's worked really well to kind of have this organic growth. Um, but again, I don't know if that's the unique situation because we have Dan, right? So Dan um basically is able to bring really interesting projects uh, and pretty diverse projects to the lab, uh, which means that it works well if we have a really diverse kind of group. Uh, almost everybody's working on stuff that they find really interesting. And um, and we are also very much, you know, Dan really encourages us to um, work on projects that we sort of find fulfilling and, and interesting. Um, mm-hmm. Dan recently wrote a book, as I'm sure you guys know, Payoff, uh, that is all about um, sort of workplace and like how to have like kind of promote happiness and, and things like that. And, and a lot of those things Dan very much practices about sort of trying to give people a sense of fulfillment in their own work and, and things like that. Um, and if you, if you're at an organization where you actually have to like more be kind of on the hunt for projects, uh, you might want to be a little bit more strategic in making sure you've got, you know, do we have a development person? Do we have, uh, do we have folks that have project management skills? Uh, do we have, um, the content area experts, um, you might want to be a little bit more strategic if you have to, you know, be strategic about, about getting, getting jobs. I hope right. I'm not going to have this interview and then Dan's going to hear it somehow and like fire me and be like, oh, you gave away all of our secrets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Proprietary information. Exclusive yeah. action design right. only. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, uh, um, uh, sorry, go ahead for some more. 
Oh. Um, yeah, so just on the flip side of that, so think about, like, you know, the fit with the organization. I mean, it comes to, like, building people who really can do this applied. So the, let's say there's, like, kind of the academic side. You know, the people that maybe do the academic style research might be, and, you know, maybe correct me if I'm wrong in this, but it's probably a little easier or, or it's a little more straightforward what the skill sets are. You know, they probably have the education and, like, you know, they've done, like, you know, they've done written thesis, they've done published papers and stuff. Um, for like the applied area, like that's a little more nebulous. Um, yeah. And those skill sets can vary a lot. And this is something I know, like I've thought and talked to people about. So like, one, like when you're hiring for people those different roles, like is that the case that generally the academics side, the people with the academic experience, is, is that a little more straightforward where, you know, they have a PhD or a master's or whatever. And then how does that turn into when you're finding people for that applied work? Um, is there some common skill sets or just there's some very unique ones depending on the field or um, how does that work for you guys? Yeah. So I think a big, so I think one of the biggest things for us is uh, when hiring for applied, we've started doing, we've started, we've basically started asking applicants to go through this assessment. Um, and it, you know, varies a little bit for like what type of project they're, they're being hired for, but almost always one of the tasks is to read an academic paper and then record yourself giving a three minute just explanation of that paper to a lay audience. Um, because that is, it can be really, really difficult because, you know, research, as you guys know, research is so nuanced. Um, and it's very easy in explaining something to get kind of bogged down in the details, to kind of be talking about p values and, and to be talking about, oh, was it a, the effect size? And it's like, that's actually not a great way to communicate kind of a core aspect of a paper or an idea to an organization that you're then trying to implement some aspect of that research. You know, they care a lot less of was it a p-value of 0.01 or was it a p-value of 0.0001, right? Um, and so so we basically kind of early on try to try to assess first of can you read and understand research? Can you like actually be able to pull it out and understand kind of what are the really interesting things about this about this paper? Um, how would you think about applying that finding in context, uh, like in a, in a, in, you know, X, Y, or Z context? Um, and then can you, could you explain to non sort of to the practitioner side or the non-research side about, you know, what is the, like, why would you would suggest this based on this paper? Do you think a public policy degree has served you well in that, for that role? Yes, actually. It was a and, softball question. It sounds like a great fit, <laughs> right? The answer is yes. Done. Um, yeah, actually, I think a lot because in public policy, right, you, you, it's a lot about kind of being able to condense more complex information into a kind of simple way to share that and present that in a, in a way that's quick and easy for folks to kind of grasp the core understanding of it. Um, and actually, I mean, we have, so I was the second policy background person to join the lab. And uh, since then, we've uh, taken on quite a few more. So uh, we found that to be actually quite a good route. Um, and and uh, just because they, you know, I think that it helps that most policy folks are interested in being on the ground and seeing implementation and being able to kind of feel like they're making impact. Um, and then, of course, still adding in some of that rigor around, you know, doing randomized control trials rather than just kind of some giving some advice on how to do things better. Um, so I think that it's actually a really nice fit in both ways, both the skills that they've gotten and then also kind of the the skill set that we're looking for as a lab. What's the breakdown of your guys' work in terms of like government focused versus other types of stuff, commercial or nonprofit or whatever? Yeah, so um, I would say, mm. <laughs> um, I would say we are probably, so currently right now, we are primarily focused on, on, we have sort of three primary areas that we're that most of the lab works on, and okay. that is sort of health decisions, which happen to be mostly either nonprofits or sort of large companies that that have a sort of stake in in health behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, for example, pharmaceutical companies, um, right. and but but we're really clear that that we are working for social good, and so we're not interested in how to get doctors to prescribe your medication. What we're interested right. in is once a doctor has prescribed that medication for you, how do you, you know, how could you do things with your packaging? How could you do things with your messaging to make sure that then that patient actually takes the medication as they're supposed mm -hmm. to? Um, so we have sort of that health side that happens to be more, um, that does, ha I think, happens to be a, a few more companies than than sort of nonprofits, but there's also some nonprofits in there. Um, and then we have uh, sort of the second big bucket, which is the common sense lab. 
uh, which is specifically financial decisions. That's me. Uh, I work. <laughs> I mean, it's me and like a whole bunch of other people. But I, right. I oversee the the Common Sense Lab uh, here in Durham. We've got two offices. We've got a San Francisco office as well. Um, and with that, we so this year within Common Sense, we're working with about twenty partners, financial service provider partners. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Durham, we work with specifically sort of that those more kind of brick and mortars. So we've got credit unions. We have like financial coaching services. Mm-hmm. Um, and in almost all cases, those are, you know, it's either like a credit union, which is a cooperative model or a, or a nonprofit. Um, so, you know, we're not working with Wells Fargo. We're not working with these other really large banks within the mm-hmm. common lab. Um, and that is part of our, because our mission specifically is it's supported by the MetLife Foundation. And our mission is very specific on financial inclusion, inclusion for low to moderate income households. And those tend to be, you know, uh, it's it, there's a little bit more mission alignment specifically with those credit unions and nonprofits. And then the San Francisco office is working with financial technology companies on this same issue. Um, and then our third bucket is our is the startup lab, which is like we work with a couple of startups uh, that come into the lab for, you know, three to six months um, to kind of learn about behavioral principles and learn about how to sort of build into their uh, some of these behavioral insights into their products. Uh, and then also building in uh, ways to do A-B testing and research and, and things like that within their products. Um, and then it's really the government stuff is like a little bit more of a hobby um, because my okay. background is public policy and right. there's a few other folks in the lab that are really interested in public policy. So it started as a course that um, that Dan was teaching for uh, the Stanford School of Public Policy that basically had master students um, match with local governments to kind of address a local government challenge. And um, so Dan and I co-taught that the first year. Um, and then the second year, we kind of took our learnings from that first year, which basically was we want fewer students, we want fewer projects, so that we can spend a little bit more time and focus on those. Mm-hmm. And um, and then, uh, so then we did it a second time. And, uh, but uh, I co-taught with Ryan Smith, who uh, is... Uh, sort of director of innovation and things like that at, at Sanford School, and uh, and again, it was a I mean it was a really unique project uh, in that and it, it continues to be in that we sort of paired master's students with like real local governments to right. address real challenges and real problems, and then instead of just kind of like writing a paper about here's our recommendation of what you do, then they actually get implemented into the field in a randomized control trial to actually measure, did these ideas work? Uh, and then kind of get getting to kind of give recommendations based on, yeah, we tried this and it, and it worked or it didn't work. Yeah, that's very cool. I mean, and so what have been some of the most interesting things that have come out of that initiative? So um, so apparently there's a, one of the things that, that's been interesting for me is that there's a huge demand uh, or, or so it appears for um, trash and recycling behavior at a local level. Hmm. So um, I think this this is it, it kind of comes out across like every every time we put out sort of calls, application calls from local governments. This is, you know, there's always somebody who's like, oh, we need to figure out how do we get residents to recycle. Um, and and so that's been kind of a fun project or it's trash related. Right. So in some cases it's recycling. In some cases it's um, better compliance with trash collection. Mm-hmm. Um, and so last year, one of the projects that we did was with the city of Fayetteville. And it was about how do we get sort of better compliance with trash collection. And this is like a particularly interesting, like, I mean, it sounds like a really dry topic because you're like, oh, great. We want people to like put their trash cans out and put them <laughs> facing the right direction. Like it, it's not it's not a sexy project. Um, but but it's actually really interesting because like garbage is actually one of the like only ways that people think about local government, like they interface with local government. Um, mm-hmm. That's an interesting point. So, yeah. So like when, if you're trash, like everybody like, uses that service, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like everybody uses that service and everybody notices when it doesn't go well. Right. Like right. it's like, if you're, you know, you don't think about the fact that like, Oh, you know, it's the, it's the local government that's been fixing the roads that you're driving on is, you know, all of these things. It's something that is like, you have an action that's, you have to like actually, you know, put your trash out and things like that. And then the minute it goes wrong and like something doesn't happen, it's like, you know, people are livid. Right. It's it's a huge source of like 
it's if people are upset with their trash collection, they're upset with their local government. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, um, I get like unreasonably annoyed when I go to take out the trash or like recycling, and it's like full, and there's no like <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's just like, or if you know, like I get annoyed by like the silliest little things, right? I get annoyed that I'm like, I did my part. I put my trash can out, and like if it was raining at all, and they they dump my trash can, and then they don't put the lid back up. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, now I got water in my trash can. I'm like so upset about it. It's like, you know, when you actually think about the fact that on any given day in Durham, it's like more than a thousand trash cans get like, you know, huge, like, like huge amounts of trash and get like just carted out of the city and you never have to think about it and worry about it again. Right. Um, but, you know, we just we just think about our own individual uh, sort of act. Mm-hmm. And and this is one of the challenges with Fayetteville, right? Is because we think about, well, it's not really a big deal if my cart is like facing the wrong direction, or it's not really a big deal if I have like overstuffed it, or it's not really a big deal if I have like bags overflowing that I put next to the trash can. Um, because we're like, oh, it's not really a big deal. Like I've done my thing, which is put the trash can out. Right. Um, and uh, of course, the city of Fayetteville has one guy that drives the trash. Like, I mean, they've got several trucks, but there's only one guy in each truck. Which means that any, and then he's got like the mechanical arm that reaches out and picks up the can and dumps it in the back. Um, now, if there's only one person who's done it wrong that he has to get out of the truck to fix it for, not a problem, right? It's what, it adds on another 15 seconds to his day. Right. But if it's every single house, now all of a sudden, like the impact of not doing it right is so much larger, but it's very difficult for us to think about kind of that in a, in a, in a large kind of, it, it's difficult for us to think about sort of the aggregated effect of our inability to kind of follow directions. Right. And, and then plus like when you're taking out your trash, it's generally like the middle of the night or it's like early in the morning, you're already like running late to work and you have to get in your car. And like, so you just like, you walk outside, you notice that like your neighbors have their trash can out and you're like, Oh crap, today's trash day. And you like run back to get your trash can. You pull it out. You're like going as fast as possible. You're probably not actually thinking about, Oh wait, am I, you know, am I facing the right direction? Am I less or am I more than four feet away from any other obstacles like a mailbox or a car? Um, you know, is all of my trash like neatly in here so that when it gets picked up, nothing's going to fall out. Um, you know, we don't really think about those things in the moment. Yeah, those are all things you need to, like, remember. Like, there's not cues right around. And it's interesting right. when you talk about, like, you know, the timing. It's like, uh, you know, it's 15 seconds in the one, but when you add all those up, it's not just, like, a lot of extra time, but it's also, like, extra cost to the government. Like, just have the truck out that much longer and, like, you know, think of that adds up over the course of a year. You know, just have, like, the get, right. like, the, yeah. just the cost of actually being out there for all of that. And if you're the trash guy, like, you know... Operating this little arm is one thing, but then having to like get up and clean everyone's trash yeah. because it keeps falling out of the trash can, like, yeah, I would be annoyed if I had to do that a couple times, especially annoyed if I had to do that all the time. Yeah. Right. I don't know. I, I feel like when I, um, if I were approaching that as, you know, like if I was taking my trash out, I think I approached that the same way as I approach a lot of things of like, there's a window of like acceptability and <laughs> I, I like, yeah, maybe my, I definitely put out a trash can and then, like, just put an extra bag of trash on top because I had too much trash in the trash can, you know? I just thought, like, oh, that's close enough. Like, it's all in the same spot. Like, this, <laughs> like it seems like what, should, what would make sense. Um, but... <laughs> okay, well, we can skip. We can skip my trash <laughs> So, right. So, so basically, I mean, we, we sort of thought the same thing, right? We thought people probably just don't, they think that what they're doing is good enough and they don't think about the impact on the trash guy. Um, and they also just think about like, they, they don't really have time to think about all the rules and any rules that, that are on the trash can are like embossed in the lid. Right. So it's the same color. It's like you, you can't see it actually like at all at any time of the day, but it's especially worse if you're trying to do this in like dusk or dawn. Um, and so with this project, the students, uh, with some support from the lab, designed just a, like a bright sticker to go on the top of the lid that was like in images. It was like three steps. Um, and it would sort of, as you got, dra- grabbed your trash can and took it out, this is like, you would see it. And so we did that. Uh, and then the other thing that we did is that we created a letter from the trash man. Hmm. So it was like, hi, resident. That would get, that would my get name me. Is Sam. <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, I'm Pete. I'm tired of picking up your trash on <laughs> the ground. Exactly. And so, so basically, it was trying to tap into this idea of so, um, so one is to kind of get a, a better sense of, of a little bit more of a concrete idea of who you're impacting by not following the directions. Um, and then, you know, it's we think it's somewhat likely related to this idea of the identifiable victim effect, um, where you know, one death or, you know, the death of one child um, is actually d- more powerful and more resonant than basically saying, you know, 100,000 children died. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this idea of being able to kind of put a name and a face of this kind of trash guy, the guy that, that who's like doing all this trash work for you would be uh, sort of more beneficial. And so there were, you know, um, so some of the houses uh, didn't get anything. Uh, it was sort of business as usual. Some of the houses got the sticker on their trash can. Uh, some of the houses got the letter and then some of the houses got both the sticker and the letter. Um, and basically, and then we sort of ran it for, for a few weeks to see like what happened with trash collection. And basically what we found is that um, people were significantly more compliant with the sticker and for like the long term, for like the, mm-hmm. the, we, I think we ran it for, for several weeks. And so for all four weeks that, that sort of trend stayed that people actually followed the rules when they were sort of reminded in the moment that they were taking their trash can out. The letter, the letter helped for the very first week. So the very first week that you, um, after that your trash can was happening after you'd gotten that letter, you, you were better about it. Um, but then it kind of just disappeared. Uh, any effects disappeared after that, which makes sense. Lives are busy. It was like helpful to remind us once, but yeah, if we don't sorry, get Sam. reminded frequently, yeah, we have limited attention. It's kind of similar, like general educational issues. Like I know there was a study on like financial literacy where like people just forgot everything about it, like a you know a year yeah. later, basically. Um, so it's like that, that that makes sense of our other like research where when you like educate people on something, they remember it for a little bit, but it doesn't stick. Yeah, it decays, okay. right? So um, that's but a the sticker. The sticker doesn't decay. That well, sticks. <laughs> well, you know, um, we've been meaning to like go back and look at some of the ca- trash cans to, because the sticker doesn't, right? It, it doesn't stay that long. You kind of they get worn out and, and stuff like that. So, but um, the the that paper on the financial the meta analysis on financial education, um, it's uh, Fernandez and Lynch, I think, are the the authors on that. But but yeah, I mean, it's 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 actually incredibly disheartening. Um, you know, it's hundreds of millions of dollars are spent every year on financial education. And according to that meta-analysis, it's 0.1% of the impact on behavior, it, like financial literacy and financial education, it improves financial behavior by 0.1%. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that that difference is actually even worse for folks who are low socioeconomic status. Who mm-hmm. um, need the most help, yeah. Exactly, <clears throat> exactly. Um, so it's really, it's super depressing. And, um, you know, we go around with common sense telling people all the time about like financial education, financial education, like doesn't, don't keep doing it. It doesn't work. You, if you want to do something, it has to be just in time education where literally you tell people about compound interest and how it works. And then you immediately ask them to sign up for retirement savings. Um, but it's not just, you can't sort of teach these things in isolations so that, that if you are, and you also need to think about, are you presenting the information in a way that's salient? But, um, you know, we, we go, uh, you know, we, we, with all of our partners and we go, kind of go to conferences everywhere. And, and this is sort of our message over and over again, is that this idea of this financial education, that's not what is going to solve the problem, right? That's not going to solve financial well-being um, and financial instability in the, in the United States or, or elsewhere. Um, and inevitably, we'll have like done a whole day workshop on this and we'll like have gone through all these different things about like, Oh, if that doesn't change behavior, what does, Oh, like maybe defaulting people into accounts, um, maybe anchoring them onto a certain amount that they should be saving for maybe doing implementation intentions around the types of goals they should be setting. And, um, and inevitably somebody is like, I think what we really need to do is like funnel more people into financial education. And it's like, ah, Why? <laughs> but it's right. It's just so counterintuitive. Yeah. Um, and we think that, like, oh, you know, if only people knew more, then this would help. But and people think of really themselves too. It's like a lot of people, you know, I hear people say all the time, they're like, oh, I, you know, why, why didn't they teach me this stuff in school? And it's like, you know, <laughs> do you really think when you're like 17, if they would have told you about like, you know, personal finance, like number one, you wouldn't listen. <laughs> number two, like, you're, you're gonna forget it in a couple of years anyway. It's like, 
I know. Think about half the stuff they did teach you in school. Like, can you still name all of the like different types of things that are make up the atmosphere? Like, I learned that in school at some point. I yeah. can't tell you like what percent is oxygen, what percent is nitrogen. Like, I have no idea. I learned that at one point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can't even name. I can't name more than like two types of dinosaurs. At one point in school, I was a beast at that. I could name them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like a spelling bee champ a couple of times. I don't know how I'm doing those now, but uh, you know, they were great when I was studying for them. Um, I still wear my bracelet for the water cycle just so that I can remember all the different phases of it. <laughs> you would. Um, <laughs> Exactly. Well, yeah, I think that's a good transition. So first of all, I just want to say, like, uh, like the, the the trash experiment. That's actually like such an interesting example because that's something that's the type of thing that like nobody really actively thinks about, but has this impact on you know public people that are working for the government and its government costs. And like you know, that, that that's I love that as a story because like even though it's it, it's surprising and it's just, it's not something you would ever think about to do like a behavioral intervention on, you know. But when you think about it, like those costs add up, all that time adds up. Um, and you know, the more we focus on that stuff, that gives us more cues and just general better, you know, resource management and stuff as well. Um, yeah. So, so this, so we're actually doing another project right now with the Durham, with the city of Durham, uh, also with their solid waste management, uh, division. And it is kind of also gets into this idea that, that, you know, one, we don't think about how this adds up, but in particular, we also really don't think at all about the opportunity costs. Of, of trash collection um, and that it's it's actually a huge expense for a city to have to get rid of the trash um, both because of the the you know man hours and labor but also because like they have to they basically have to pay another like facility to deal with it um, and it's you know it's it's I, I don't remember the, the numbers offhand but it's something like a dollar uh, it's something like a dollar 20 for like per uh, oh no no sorry it's like 30 bucks per ton of garbage for the city to get rid of but it's like a dollar 50 per ton of recycling mm -hmm. um and so like i mean when you think about sort of across the city how many tons of yeah. garbage are produced every day um if you could actually even just take half of that and move that into recycling it's what the enormous. revenue for the city yeah. would be and where else that could be used so we're actually uh soon going to be launching a, an experiment here in durham about trash as well basically trying to get folks to move some of to think about those opportunity costs and move some of that uh some of those things that are in the garbage can that should be recycled into a recycling bin um and so essentially what we're what we're doing we'll we'll see it's a little bit creative and out there but um essentially what we're doing is we're we're putting again stickers uh on trash cans but instead of being on top of the lid we're putting them actually on the side at different levels um, and basically saying, can you, like, how low can you go in your trash can? Um, mm -hmm. And then basically saying, if, if everybody only filled their can to this high, and it's about like halfway down their can, um, that would be an additional 50 bus shelters for the city. Um, if everybody only filled their, their can this high, and it's like even lower, it's like, this would be an additional 15 playgrounds across the city. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so kind of playing around with this idea of, you know, trash isn't just trash, it's actually tax dollars that could be used on other things if it had if it didn't have to be used at, on on trash cans. So, it's kind of creating that cool. context and framing that yeah, I, I would have never thought of. Like I've never thought about trash as deeply as I am right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm regularly told that I help people think about trash. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good trait. <laughs> Um, so I love those examples. And then, you know, we started shifting a little bit into like the kind of financial literacy sort of thing. Um, so like, let's maybe like shift gears to that a little bit. So yeah, like, like we were talking about, so we kind of know that generally, obviously financial, uh, I work kind of in the financial space as well. It's like, there's just uh, kind of endless problems with how, uh, you know, and I think in a lot of ways, like money is almost the ultimate like behavioral like problem. It's just like almost everything about the way our finance, our personal finance and everything is structured goes against our like natural instincts. Um, <laughs> so, so if like financial literacy isn't like, isn't the most effective, like what are the ways you've found or what are some examples of studies you've done or like, um, you know, what would you recommend to people to get started to improve their financial situation or what should they be working on? Yeah. So, so I think one of the big things with financial decisions, um, so first of all, it's one of the most complicated things because uh, it's asking you to do these kind of two major trade-offs. 
So one of the first major trade-offs is that you, you're needing to prioritize the future over the present, which, you know, psychologically, we're just not designed to do. And there's all kinds of reasons, right? Evolutionarily, it, it you know, it was really bad idea to be kind of so focused on the future that you couldn't kind of get out of the way of the lion in front of you. Um, and so, so there's all kinds of reasons why we, we really focus on the present. It's very difficult for us to sort of prioritize the future, which anytime we're asking people to save money, that's essentially what we're asking them to do is kind of give up something in the here and now for something potentially in the future. Um, so that's sort of the, the first big kind of psychological challenge to savings. And then the second one is that we feel very different about things that are concrete versus things that are abstract. Um, there's a, a nice study that was done, um, and actually I'm blanking on the researcher at the moment, but um, where they had, uh, where they essentially um, had folks, this was a lab experiment, where they had folks um, just try to like say how much they would be willing to pay. It was like an auction scenario, and there was a chance that you would actually have to pay, so it was trying to keep things in the, in the realm of reality. Um, but a third of the people, they were given the tech, just like the, 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 whatever it was that they were auctioning on were, um, just written in text. So it was like a Snickers bar. Um, and then the, in the second condition, so another third of people, they would see a picture of what it is that they were bidding on. So kind of moving from abstract to like slightly more concrete. Um, and then the third condition, it was like, they were actually in the room with the items that they were bidding on, but they were sort of behind plastic. So you couldn't touch them, but they were there in front of you in concrete. And in this study, what they found is that people were willing to pay almost twice as much if it was concrete and physical in front of them, mm. which means that basically like giving up a pair of like tennis shoes or giving up like, you know, giving up something that is like right in front of you and you're just, or a new shirt and you're deciding not to buy it in this moment. Like it's not an equivalent but it's, 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 you basically have to imagine like twice as much savings, um, because just for the, just for the abstract nature of like that, that money is abstract and it's not concrete in front of you and savings is, is abstract. And so this, these, the tennis shoes are really, it's like, they're twice as appealing to us than just that money in abstract terms. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that makes this decision to like, kind of not buy something concrete in front of us right now and sort of put that into this sort of savings account, abstract, whatever later, it just makes that a really difficult decision. Um, and it makes it, and, and the big thing is that it, it just requires it an incredible amount of self-control. And so the most, some of the most successful savings devices have really kind of taken self-control out of it. And so they've kind of bound people's hands through these like pre-commitment devices. Um, so thinking about, you know, retirement savings, which we're still not doing great on, but the most effective retirement savings products so far have been sort of through workplace retirement programs where they take it out of your paycheck. And so you just, you know, it's before it even ever hits your account, it's just out and gone and you just don't even see it. You don't even think about it. So you're not even tempted to spend it. Um, and so thinking about other ways to kind of build this pre-commitment, uh, you know, in, into systems. So, uh, we have, so the San Francisco office in, uh, they had a project with Digit. Are you guys familiar with Digit? Yes, I love yeah. Digit. Yeah. yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. Were you guys using it like last year at tax season? Uh, I, I started so, using yeah. it. Yeah, I think so. Okay, I've so used you, it for about might, a year. you might have been in our experiment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think we might have, I think we did it with a subsample of Digit users. So I won't, uh, don't be alarmed if you weren't in the experiment, but. Um, I'd be very disappointed if I wasn't. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> if part of the experiment was sending people gifts, then I was part of it, and I was very excited. <laughs> what? When uh, I had a certain savings amount, I got a little seal that clapped his hands for me. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. That was like not it. our experiment, and I wish it was now. <laughs> for next time. Um, yes. So our experiment was actually around tax times. So tax time is one of the, is basically considered one of the best opportunities to try to encourage savings. Um, now, some would argue with good reason that actually a refund is savings, um, that essentially it, it was savings throughout the year because you were having sort of the government take more of your money than, than they should have. And then, um, you know, then you're, you're getting kind of all of this later. It's a forced savings mechanism. Mm -hmm. But there's been a lot of emphasis on trying to get people to actually then, once they get their refund, to also then save some of it for other things. And so we worked, so one of the challenges has been, I mean, it's been very difficult to get people to save part of their refund. And one of the challenges is because 
once you know what your refund is going to be, you've already thought of all the things that you're going to use it for. Um, whether it's, you know, oh, you're going to send more to your student loans, which, which is a good financial behavior as well. But, um, or you think like, oh, I can't wait to get, you know, it timed well with a new iPhone upgrade or, um, these other things that, that we already kind of already get in our mind of what we're going to do with this, this refund. Um, and so with digit, we actually had digit, um, we worked with digit to have them, um, message some of their users before, like in early January, before they'd gotten their refund with a message, a tax message that said, you might get a refund this year. Um, if you, you know, if you do, how much of it would you like to save? And so, um, and then people could enter in a certain amount. Um, and then once the refund, if they got a refund and it hit their account, Digit would recognize it as hitting their account and automatically move that money over yeah. into a savings account. Um, so yeah. it was a pre-commitment that then also had teeth to it. Now the other group, so um, within within our test sample, so half of it got this, this notification beforehand. Then the other half, it was when their tax refund hit their account. Digit sent them a text message that said, you just got your tax refund, or it looks like you just got a tax refund. How much of it would you like to save? Um, mm -hmm. And we actually found that across both conditions, about 15% saved something, which is great, which is not bad when you, when, you know, you look at the national average of splitting your tax refund and it's like 2%. It's very, very low. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact of just like asking people like, hey, this is an opportunity to save. Do you want to save? 15% said yes. It's even sparking um, that thought of like, oh yeah, I should save this. Yeah, exactly. It's just like <laughs> it's just like kind of planting the seed. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, um, and then but but one of the nice things is that we actually find that it's people saved about twice as much in the pre-commitment condition. So when they were asked before they had their their actual refund in hand, they saved uh, like twice as much. Um, wow. And. Uh, and basically it was because they were, it was like before they were tempted, right? They kind of were able to tie their hands. And then even sort of three months after, uh, you know, after tax season, we went and looked at accounts and 85% of that savings was still there. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't that it hit wow, an account and then good. moved it. It actually like hit their, hit their savings account and, and was sticky there, which is what we expected. Um, in the, it stayed in their digit account. Yeah, exactly. Is there something to that too? So there's like the pre commitment, but there's also because um, you sent it. Because when did they send the prompt? Uh, was it in like January or like you know? So right. So so the, this is the tricky thing about the experiment, right? So the the, the prompt in January uh, was everybody in January was before they got their taxes. But the yeah. problem is you, we don't actually know exactly when somebody's when going to file their it, yeah. taxes and get them. Yeah. And so then so the the one that asked when they got it that was sprinkled throughout the tax season. Okay. Mm. Um, yeah, because I wonder if, like, with a pre-commitment group that, like, got it early and committed to that, like, there, there's part of that, too, where there's, like, sort of the future self um, sort of thing, where, like, you always think that in the future you're more disciplined than you are, um, where it's, where your present self is always a lot more, um, uh, less disciplined, if you will. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, it's totally. just like, it's like, and you're I'll... like, oh, yeah, next week I'm going to go to the gym five times, I'm going to eat, like, you know, totally like vegan or whatever and then like the week comes you're like oh i was busy this week you know i, just, I deserve like some ice cream <laughs> um and it's kind of that same sort of thing where you're like oh yeah like in april like i, sh I should definitely save that but when it's in the present like there's uh, uh, there's so much more battling for your attention of what that should be like in the moment yeah exactly and that's uh, that's one of the huge challenges with savings right is that it's really difficult to get somebody to decide right now to save and it's much easier to ask them to save next month Mm -hmm. And you know they, yep. They think their future self is going to have better self control. They think their future self will have less expenses. They think their future self will have fewer emergencies. Um, you know all of these things. So it's much easier to get somebody to commit their future selves, uh, who they think are is just generally more responsible and like a better person than than themselves at this moment. But, I think the other thing that with Digit that has helped me is that I don't know how to access it <laughs> to take money out. <laughs> same yeah and, and like that's good yeah like it's kind of like your 401k it's like you like cannot yeah. go get that without like major penalties where like if it was yeah. just easy to pop in and out like you know i'm sure i would have taken something out by now <laughs> like I, know. I thought about it at one point that it was like oh i don't even know because i looked i was like oh i've got like a couple thousand dollars in here like maybe i could move some to something else and it was like i don't know how to take it out and i don't even want to learn because it just will ruin it for me if i do that's awesome <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, there's and there's actually there was also a recent paper that just came out. Um, I'll send you guys the link, but um, that basically said that people like people like it when it's sticky, right? People mm. actually prefer this this so you know we know that we're bad at self-control and so people like it when there's other external mechanisms to help help their self-control um and so there's some studies where they looked at like kind of asking people to choose where to put their money and some had sort of restrictions and some had different interest rates and people were even willing to take a lower interest rate if it was a restricted savings account if it would like kind of help tie their hands they were willing to take a less like a lower interest rate um on that on that money so yeah. Yeah, I think you guys are, you're totally right. And what we find is that like, if you want people to be successful savers, for example, with financial decisions, it's not about education. It's about sort of like creating these accounts that, um, you know, make it easy to put money in, but difficult to take money out um, that are able to kind of do this, keep sort of keep that out of mind. Um, you know, we've actually been thinking and, and with a couple of different partners about uh, displaying your savings balance versus actually hiding your saving balance and requiring people to kind of get a little deeper into it to see. Um, and, and, Adding you know, there's friction. Yeah. exactly, exactly. And that this idea of like, you know, you don't, um, you know, you, you don't want to allow people to kind of just have the liquidity with that. Um, although, to be fair, like even just having in a separate account is helpful, right? It uses sort of these mental accounts. We think of money differently if they're in different buckets. Yeah. Um, so even having it in a, in, a, in a bucket that is labeled savings um, helps to be a little bit stickier. Um, but there's there's some also, I keep bringing up different papers, guys, but there's another uh, interesting paper out there that shows that if it is labeled for a, like something that's considered like a noble purpose, so, um, you know, so if it's, if it's, if this is your retirement savings or if this is your like savings for your child's college, mm -hmm. um, these like very aspirational, um, sort of noble goals, um, and, and an emergency comes up that you will, that, that some folks will actually go to debt that is higher cost than pull out from some of those accounts, um, mm -hmm. because it's such a feeling of failure. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. however, they're willing to pull out of those accounts, uh, if it's like a vacation savings account, mm -hmm. um, then they're willing to pull out of that rather than going to, to sort of a higher interest debt. So there's this, there's some, there's some really wonderful things about mental accounting. Um, but there are some cases where mental accounting might actually, uh, make you choose some sort of less optimal financial decisions. Yeah. So those topics, like what are some ways, like, so some like clear takeaways. So like the, how are some ways people can tie their hands, so to speak, where like, um, so digits one way we just talked about like you know kind of automate for those yep. that aren't familiar like it, it automates your savings and puts them away in this uh, this account um, that as we're saying is hard to access in a good way uh, but like what are some other ways people can take advantage of those things like that sort of aspirational goals and just the actual like the fixed um, the fixed savings that's hard to access like uh, um, are there other products or are there things people can kind of like DIY sort of thing yeah so I mean I think one of my favorite kind of examples is like, if you know that you're going to be tempted. So, well, there's a couple of things, but one is if you know that you're going to be, you know, if you want to go to happy hour on Fridays with after work with friends, but you like know that you always end up spending more than you want to, then, you know, just take out the cash that you want to spend. So one thing is that you actually spend less if you're spending in cash. Um, it's kind of like the pain of paying, right? It's like, it's more exactly. painful handing over cash. Yeah, exactly. Um, but also you want to be really deliberate about the size of your bills. So this is like a weird thing, but if you if you just take one bill that's like a fifty dollar bill, the minute you break that into smaller amounts, then that whole fifty is going to go faster. Interesting. Um, and so it'd actually be better to actually have it in like ten dollar bills, and then mm -hmm. because each time you break, because the, it, like you feel bad breaking the next bill, and so it slows down that spending. It's another little hack. So that, um, so that we, can be, we can be the annoying one at the bank that's like, I need this all in fives, please. Like, <laughs> <laughs> because I can't stop myself. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it, it makes you kind of stop and think like, oh, gosh, do I really want to break this next bill? Yeah. Um, and there's, there's, you know, the Carolina Theater here in downtown Durham uh, has, if you buy a large popcorn, it's actually like the bag is only slightly larger than a medium, but it comes with a, like, a ticket for like a free refill. And it's like such a brilliant design. I don't think that they 
are fully aware of like how beautifully designed this is because it's like a win for them. It like helps the customer actually eat less because you get to the bottom of the bag and you're like, Hmm, do I really need a whole nother bag of popcorn? Right. And like nine times out of 10, the answer is no, right? You really don't need a whole nother bag of popcorn. <laughs> and so you end up paying significantly more for only just like a little bit more than a medium um, because you, you think at the beginning, like, Oh yeah, this is great. I'm going to want more popcorn. Um, but if they had just sold it to you all in like a bag that was twice the size, you likely would have eaten the whole thing and they would have lost that, that sort of, and they would have had to pay for all that extra popcorn. Um, and so having these type, kind of natural breaks where you can actually kind of stop and ask yourself, oh, wait, do I want to take this next step um, are really, really helpful. And so breaking bills is a natural way to do it. Um, a lot of folks still use the envelope method, which is where they kind of separate their money out into different categories. And, um, and they say, this is how much I have to spend on groceries. And it's like all that money is in cash and in a, the same envelope. And so that when you kind of get, so when you, you know, start to get towards the end of that, you start thinking like, oh gosh, do I really want to dig into another envelope? That kind of creates uh, that concrete, uh, like we were, you were talking about before. It's like uh, with the shoes and stuff, it's like that creates that concrete, like easy to see, like whereas a budget that's in an app or something is much more like nebulous, you know? Right, exactly. And it's so and it's so hard to think about those opportunity cost trade-offs, right? So the, the essence of money imagine, management is that like any time you like spend anything or do anything with any money, you should be thinking about, you know, what else could I do with this money? Um, like, what am I giving up in order to do what I'm doing now? So it's like every time we buy a cup of coffee, instead of thinking like, oh, I'm buying a cup of coffee, we should be thinking about what are you giving up because you're buying a cup of coffee? And what we find is mostly like people can't think of other things that they're giving up. Um, you know, we, uh, this was a few years ago, it was actually before I joined at the lab, but folks at the lab went to a Toyota dealership, and they just were asking folks, um, what are you giving up if you buy a Toyota today? And by and large, like the, the most common answer was nothing. People couldn't come up with anything that they were giving up with. And this is like a huge purchase. It's a car. Yeah. Um, and people still couldn't think about what they were giving up in order to get a Toyota. Um, and then when really pushed, it said, you know, this is a big price. This is a big purchase. It means that there's something else you can't purchase. Um, what are you giving up? The next most common response was a Honda. If I buy a Toyota today, I can't buy a Honda. So the trade-offs that they were making were like in the same domain. It was like a car for a car and it was today uh -huh. for today. When really what you'd want somebody to be saying is like, oh, I'm giving up, I'm giving up, you know, five vacations over the next three years. Uh, I'm giving up, um, you know, I'm giving up living, you know, I'm, I'm giving up living in a, a mother-in-law apartment at my kid's house versus, uh, you know, in my own home at the beach when I'm in retirement. You know, all of these other things thinking about, you should be thinking across domains and across time frames, but we just can't do that. But when you take, and, and when you have sort of money in a larger lump sum, the, the larger, the more money you have at any given moment, the harder it is to think about those opportunity costs. And so the other sort of budget hack is instead of taking your monthly paycheck and saying this is how, and like thinking about that as your balance, um, breaking that apart and saying, actually, what's, what do I have today? And kind of thinking through it in a daily budget rather than a monthly budget. Um, and that, that also helps kind of control some of that spending. And we actually did a project with Propel, who's an app uh, that on for SNAP uh, recipients. So SNAP is the Supplemental Nutrition mm -hmm. Assistance Program. And um, so they basically they developed an app um, specifically to allow SNAP beneficiaries to check their balance. Because one of the things that they were finding is that people were going into, you know, 7-Elevens and mini markets and stuff and trying to buy something really small as just a way to check to see how much money they still had on their card. Um, and so Propel uh, developed this app that basically allowed people to check their balance, kind of track their, their EBT spending. Um, and then there's also some add-on other features to it. But um, so we worked with them and we said, well, you know, let's, let's actually, instead of saying this is what your, how much snap you have left for the month, let's actually break this into a weekly budget. And so kind of, because what we found in the, the data is that actually people use 80% of their benefits within the first nine days of the month that they've gotten their SNAPs benefits. So they use 80% up in the first nine days. Um, and so just, it's so easy to spend when you have, when you're not thinking about those opportunity costs. And then as the budget gets tighter, you start really thinking, man, do I really need this or should I get something else? Um, 
And so by changing it from a monthly budget to a weekly budget, we were able to extend that 80% two days. So now it was 11 days, um, which is, you know, it's a, it's a modest increase, but I mean, that's an additional six meals for a household um, by just, you know, not giving any additional money, literally just saying like, let's, instead of talking about this at a monthly rate, let's talk about it in a weekly rate. It also wasn't changing the actual disbursement. It was literally just changing the display. Um, so. Yeah, I've noticed that for myself with like budget. I've tried that before. I, I break down my like budget for something to a daily, or just my spending money, for example, like a daily. And yeah. it does make it so much more, it's so much easier to track in a lot of ways. Cause like, you're like, okay, well, you know, if I spend a hundred dollars today, that means I can only spend like 25 tomorrow. Like, what do I have going on tomorrow? And like, it definitely makes <laughs> you like think about it. Cause otherwise you're just like, oh, you know, I'll spend a bunch this weekend and I just won't do anything next weekend. And of course you want to do something the next weekend. Like, um, yeah, it's breaking down those. E it's like it's just easier to manage chunks, you know, that are that are yeah. easier to process and understand. And and the truth is that that's really hard math for most folks to do, right? Like it would be one thing if you could just actually take your paycheck and just divide it by thirty days, but because like our expenses, most of our expenses aren't daily, right? Right. So there's this there's this huge mismatch in that you know our income is usually monthly or biweekly. Um, we have some expenses that are daily, we have some expenses that are weekly, we have some expenses that are once a month, we have some expenses that are once a year, we have some expenses that are once every six months, we have some expenses that are going to happen but we don't know when they're gonna happen. Um, and so it, this idea of budgeting is just, it's, it's like a, a huge mental feat uh, to ask people to be able to like, at any given moment, actually know how much money do they actually have available to spend. Yeah. It's oh. painful. <laughs> I never enjoyed budgeting myself. I don't know if anybody else, but <laughs> so I know. I mean, as you guys are, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, like, and it's 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 I feel like budgeting, I mean, I, I think I'm a little I'm a bit of a cynic on this budgeting thing because I think that it's such a it's such an impossible feat for folks to do. And you know, almost every time you talk to a financial, you know, anybody like a financial coach or financial counseling, everybody says the first thing you need to do is get a budget. It's like your budget, you know, for, for particularly for like low to moderate income households, your budget is like so constantly changing. Um, you know, when, when we think about, you know, your budgeting gr is great if your expenses are always the same and your income is always the same, uh, then it's great. Yep. Make a budget and stick to it. But when you're constantly actually having to readjust your budget uh, because you're an hourly worker and you you worked five hours le less this pay cycle than the one before that. And now all of a sudden you have to re go through the mental math of all of this. Um, I just, I'm a little bit down on it. I kind of feel like it's like when people still tell you to balance your checkbook and it's mm -hmm. like, guys, who does that? Nobody does that. It's such like Nobody a check anymore. Yeah. Cause if you want somebody to get started, that's like the most painful possible way to get started. I mean, that's like, that's <laughs> like if somebody said, that's like if somebody said that they wanted to like lose weight, and you didn't say like, oh, well, first to start exercising 20 minutes a day or first start cutting out bread or something. It'd be like, okay, start tracking your calories to the exact <laughs> calorie every day. And then yeah. after that, we'll start doing the other stuff. I'm like, no one would yeah, ever recommend that. I want you to count every no minute sense. of your day and how active you are being for each of those minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like you, know, you would never tell somebody in something like that to get that granular right away. Um, yeah. They never get started, and, but for some reason, that's like what we think we should do with, uh, with personal finance. So, yeah. And I, you know, I think there's something powerful in tracking, right? There is something powerful in tracking, as long as it's not like so demotivating. But you know, I mean, when I was a study, when I studied abroad in college, I literally tracked my daily expenses because I was on a very limited budget, um, and so I would be in the store and I'd be like, oh, "God, I don't want to write this down in my tracking sheet," and so I wouldn't buy it. Because it was like, not necessarily because I was like, oh, I don't want to waste the money. It was literally because I was like, oh, I don't want to have to like go into my tracking sheet and do this extra work and extra you had, effort. like mentally connected the two together. So it was like, if I do yeah. that, I have to do this. And I don't want to do that. Yeah. Exactly. And so it was great. It was a great way to like, you know, reduce spending. Um, but it wasn't because, so I think that there's like, there is some power in the act of tracking. Um, but I'm, I'm dubious about how budgeting is currently done. Um and there's, I, you know, I think Level has been trying to, like, revision how you do, Level's another app, um, sort of revision how, and, and even as well, some of those are thinking about how do you kind of readjust how people budget, because this idea of, like, how much you spend on groceries, what's your income, what's the, you know, and, and trying to go through that exercise is just, 
it's just not very helpful, I think, for a lot of folks. Yeah. And I think it also speaks to like a common misconception about mm -hmm. low income people that they don't know how much things cost or that they're not good at like determining what the impact of buying something is on their budget. And like the example that you give of having a small budget when you're studying abroad, like I think just people who have a limited budget very are very, you know, sensitive to changes in price or and not necessarily as, you know, to, to sales and that sort of thing. Yeah, there's, there's some actually wonderful studies out there that like I, that, so it drives me nuts when people are like, oh, poor people just need to learn how to manage their money. And it's like, mm, no, uh, actually, poor people are more rational with their money than most people. Um, they actually think about the value of a dollar as the value of a dollar. Um, if you are, if you stand outside of a grocery store and ask people coming out, um, and if you if you only ask people who have bought milk and you ask them how much does milk cost, high income folks will have no idea. They'll have just bought it, but they have no idea, like what it actually costs. What could have been um, ten dollars? I know they're like, oh. but you ask low income folks and they like, they can tell you exactly how much it costs and how much it was with tax. Right. Um, that, that, uh, low income folks are, are generally much, much, much better at knowing exactly how much costs, how much stuff costs, what the value of that dollar is. Um, they do think more about the opportunity costs of it. Um, and there's, there's some really great research out there. There's, uh, around this whole topic. Um, a lot of it is by Samuel Molinathan and Elder Shafir. Um, but they, uh, there's also, there's a really nice, there's, there was a study that was done in New York City that looked at um, taxi rides, like estimating how much a taxi would cost. And, you know, taxis are actually like pretty painful, like thinking about pain of paying, like pretty painful experiences because you're literally sitting there and just watching the meter go up and up yeah. and up and up, right? <laughs> Um, it's a, it's like it's like filling gas, right? That's also the reason why people will drive like twenty minutes out of their way to get like thirty cents, mm. like spend thirty cents less on their entire tank for gas, is because it's like so painful just to like watch the meter go. Um, but so in New York, they asked, they basically planned a route in like at a time of day, and they asked people on the street uh, how much, what would the what would the taxi fare be to go from this point to this point at this time of the day. And they asked both high income folks and low income folks. Now, this is New York City. So high income folks significantly more likely to take taxi, low income folks more likely to be taking the subway anyway. Um, and, uh, and what they found, to no surprise, is that low income folks were significantly better at estimating that cost. Um, and so like they, they spend more time thinking about money, they understand more about what money can buy and can't buy. Um, and they, they but it's a huge responsibility to have to constantly be thinking about these trade-offs. And so we all make mistakes. Like we all are, are subject to, to sort of regret spending or splurge purchases that aren't good for us. But if you have enough room in your budget, that's okay. Right. You have the slack for it. And mm -hmm. the problem you have a, you is have a margin for error. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And the problem is that like low income folks don't have that margin. And so although they make those, those mistakes less often, those mistakes are just costlier for them. Yeah. Right. So as you're thinking about, like in your role at Common Sense, um, there's obviously all these like challenges just in terms of the inner workings of people's minds. Um, there are challenges in terms of financial institutions and the way that financial products are set up. And it sounds like there's also challenges in the sense of, you know, like the example of financial education as a remedy where not necessarily prescribing the right thing to fix it. So how are you kind of thinking about path work for you and your group? What are the things that you're excited about? Yeah. Kind of challenges that you see. Yeah. So, um, so for us, we have like a very clear goal. Uh, we have a very clear mission and that is to improve, like to measurably improve uh, the financial well-being of 1.8 million people living in the United States by the end of uh, 2018. So that's like coming up. <laughs> um, and we're not there yet. But, um, you know, and I think I think what's been really a learning experience for us. Uh, so, I mean, it's been very easy for us to find excited, 
and willing partners who are already trying to do good things and rethink the way that that um, sort of financial services are delivered. Um, and so that's been a really nice, wonderful experience with this is just kind of being able to get to know all of the different kind of organizations in the field that are on the ground doing this work and really already thinking creatively about how to do it beyond financial education. Um, I think that the thing that is alarming is at the same time realizing how many players out there that are really large players are really not actually designing for, um, you know, for this population, for the low to moderate income population, but also just they are very much, you know, they're just not designing for the consumer at all. Um, and, and, you know, as we think about how it becomes, you know, I mean, all of these, you know, Apple Pay, like all of these things that are just basically making it easier and easier for people to spend money. Um, but there's also, you know, there's also the way that large financial institutions uh, don't report out about sort of the different things that they're charging cons like consumers, that it's like very buried. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's, I think in, in you know, some in, in effort not to get sued, I won't name any uh, in particular, but <laughs> There are Don't some want any large litigation bank. from this podcast for sure. <laughs> <laughs> there are some very large banks that, um, you know, in the pie chart, you know, they've almost all of these have like developed these personal finance financial management tools with like the the Intuit pie chart. But in almost all of those, they don't actually even have a category for bank fees. Mm. And bank fees, it's like it's between like one point five and four billion dollars a year mm -hmm. that people spend on bank fees. Um, and the fact that that's not even getting, it's, it's, it's certainly not being called out at all to the consumer about how much they're paying in fees, um, that, that potentially would actually get them to think about, oh, maybe I need to do something else. And I think what's also alarming, there was an article that just came out in the New York Times, actually, uh, about how banks are trying to restrict the amount of information that fintech companies can get from banks. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, basically even if you give the fintech company like mint or somebody like that if you give them your uh your your logins for your um for your bank right. accounts that uh the bank you know the bank is basically trying to limit the amount of information that they share then with these other like parties mm -hmm. um but it's really the other parties that can do things like emphasize how many fees you're paying um right. and they can really emphasize like oh you know maybe you should do x y and z and so, you know, as much as I would like to think that these larger players are not deliberately trying to hurt people, it becomes harder and harder to believe that uh, with some of this research. You know, yeah. you, you know, we talk about like the how, you know, fees are being buried, um, but also like there's been a lot of advocacy around um, and, and sort of lobbying for, for uh, the minimum payment on credit cards. And actually the presence of a minimum payment uh, decreases how much people actually pay on their credit card mm. because the minimum payment is so low compared to the rest of the balance. It's like an anchor, having, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They anchor on to that. And so that they, so they're like, Oh, okay, that's how much I'm supposed to pay. And so they pay their minimum payment, mm. which means that they are paying huge amounts in credit card debt. Um, yeah. I didn't never really understand minimum payment. Like I remember when we were putting on comp our conference and stuff like that, and it, you know, we paid for like a caterer and a bunch of other stuff. And you know, it's like tens of thousands of dollars. It's like, oh, twenty-five dollar minimum payment. I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, drop in the bucket. <laughs> right. It's tiny, oh, and like, so easy. And it, <laughs> it like it it by and large like doesn't even cover the interest right of it that month yeah. on your on your payments. And so, and it's actually like the presence of that minimum payment. Uh, drives down how much people pay on their credit cards. So, it, you know, and those are things that like, if, if, you know, it's, it's a huge, it's a lucrative business for credit cards. And mm -hmm. I think that there's a, a major concern about, you know, if they change them, then will credit cards continue to survive? Um, but it's, I think from, from my perspective, it's disheartening to see that how many of these folks are, are really kind of focusing on their bottom line rather than what's good for the client, good, good for the customer. And it's no wonder that we are kind of in the financial uh, you know, status that we are. Yeah. So so many so like bad they... incentives, you know, um, and yeah. you, know, you would hope people go beyond just like the, the um, 
you know, go beyond just that bottom line all the time. Now some like social good component, and, uh, but uh, you know, sh shareholders don't always care. I guess so. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. But it's crazy. It's like even even sometimes like well intentioned, you know, mission aligned folks. There's so you know um, another major banking fee, right? Is is these overdraft charges, right. which which most places they don't call it overdraft because that sounds bad. They call it courtesy pay, right? Like, well, we're oh. doing a favor for you. Thank you for uh, letting me use this ATM. I will gladly pay for the <laughs> the privilege. Yeah, exactly. And and like this, like, oh, you know, don't worry if you can't make it. We'll spot you. Like, don't worry if you don't have enough money in your account for this. We'll spot you the difference. And then charge you like a, an arm and a leg. Even if you go over by a dollar, we'll charge you, you know, 30 bucks for it. Um, but... Uh, so, so this this idea of courtesy pay. I mean, courtesy pay and this these overdraft fees are that's what pays for free checking for everyone, mm -hmm. right? So, so free sort check like chicken and egg sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, and and what happens is that it ends up actually being just a very regressive, like form of 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 banking, because right. the people who are least able, least sort of able or in a position to pay for banking are actually subsidizing banking for everyone else. Mm -hmm. So are you then thinking more in terms of like, you know, obviously doing research and then working with partners to like develop better products? Or I mean, a lot of what you're talking about sounds almost like advocacy of kind of pushing different policies to say, and this is maybe just the public policy background shining through. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, what sort of role do you see yourself and the sort of the organization playing? Yeah. So we, so, you know, we are still primarily a research lab, right? So we are still very much Duke University research lab. And in our first year of Common Sense, which we completed our first year uh, in December. And, um, and so that was really about like, let's just try to figure out if we've got a model that works, if we got folks that are interested, and if we can actually have some proof of concept work that, that be, be able to show that can we use these small nudges to make things work. Um, and it was great, right? We had, um, I think we, we ran, we were able in the first year to like run and complete like seven experiments. And I think that like, I, I have to double check my numbers, but, um, and I think we, like all but one, we had significant effects, mm -hmm. which is great. Wow. Yeah. It's, it'll get harder as it goes on because like <laughs> you start first with like the low hanging fruit that you're like, Oh, you know yeah. what? I think we'll work. Let's change the default. Right. And then like, right. Oh wow. It works. Keep yep. the local <laughs> maximum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but as you know, it will, it'll get, you know, I think that 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 success rate um, will likely not stay as high as it is, because we'll start kind of really pushing ourselves more. Um, but so in our second year, we're, we are kind of thinking about now we've got this process, let's continue to do it to continue to find good partners and to continue to do this work. But at the same time, let's be deliberate about how do we scale these things. Um, because in the sort of one off partnerships, uh, you know, self-help credit union only has so many members. Right. Um, and so we do both. And, and actually, I should say we, we, we are primarily a research lab. So most of our stuff is research. But we do actually try every year to do three prototypes that are kind of new products, new services. So that's rather than just like a little tweak, that's actually something like new to the field that other organizations, and it could either be apps or it could be um you know, where we've been working with self-help to develop a new retirement product, a retirement mm -hmm. savings product. And um, so some of these are, are, are larger things. And the idea is that once we've gotten those in, out and sort of market tested a little bit, then those will also scale up and become, you know, commonplace, which would be great. Um, and then I think on the side, we also do uh, try to have conversations with, you know, um, with folks who are in the policy world to try to make some of those uh, policy recommendations. But yeah. Um, but but that's sort of a more uh, it's a it's a less sort of a lesser priority at this point. Um, yeah. I would imagine that after we have a cohesive idea of this is what a good service looks like, and we've got you know even more because right now it's it's we have like this these all these different experiments that are kind of across places. But ideally, we'll get to a point where we can come forward and say actually. Like, this is what a good bank looks like. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, across a whole bunch of different things about, like, this is what banks should be shooting for. Um, then we'll have a little bit more tangibility around uh, and a little bit more concreteness around what a policy recommendation would be. 
Yeah, because the results can be advocacy, advocacy in, in themselves. You know, if the right people, decision makers, see these like results that you're getting and these products that are working, um, you know, you just got to get them in the hands of the right people and like show those effects. Like, uh, you know, they kind of feed into each other. So. Yeah. Um, well, and we also have to prove the business case for them, right? Yeah. So. Um, right. So we have to, that's, I think that that is, that is sometimes a tricky situation is that if, great, we can, we can show ways that we can reduce like overdrafts. Um, so then we need to make sure that we have a way that we can actually convince banks or, or other folks that this is a worthwhile um, project for them. Because if we can't get, if we can't pitch something to Wells Fargo, for example, um, that will both that, that they'd be interested in both because it's good for their customers, but also because it would be good for them in the long run. Mm -hmm. And actually Wells Fargo might be an easier pitch right now because of the, um, you know, they've got some social, they, they could <laughs> right. use some, they could use some goodwill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> good exactly. publicity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, it's, so we, we also, I think that's another reason why we do work with partners in even the development of prototypes and, and, and all of our work is that, you know, we don't want to recommend things that are actually going to drive a bank bankrupt. Yeah. Um, right. But yeah. we have to exist to do good. <laughs> ex exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but at the same time, like we do want to pressure them when they're doing things that we think are not good. Mm -hmm. So. Right. Yeah. Did that answer your questions, Rock? It definitely do does. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, so this is a little bit of a non sequitur. Um, but in terms of like how you guys define yourselves as an organization, um, you know, so you say like we're still primarily a research institution or like research-based group. Um, when you've got like a um, split of like 75% practitioner, 25% researcher, is that like a cultural definition or is that, uh, you know, because like, all of those folks are still kind of doing research in the field as they're kind of doing like facing stuff. So I think yeah. what you asked. <laughs> not good, so not good, wi asked. not good Wi-Fi in Austria, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so the lab being sort of seventy-five percent practitioners and twenty-five percent researchers. Um, you know, I think that. So, I think that. You know, we sort of we sort of break it down a little bit uh, around, um, you know, applied researchers and, and researchers. Um, and, and because, because for us, a, a big part of it is still actually doing research in the field, right? It's, you're still doing randomized controlled trials. You're still kind of using the academic rigor and, and that framework to, to like figure out if something's working or not working. Yeah. Um, but I think that we, and, and at the same time, um, even if folks are primarily working on applied projects, um, they also are using some of the other lab research at their disposal, whether they're absorbing it from other folks or whether even in some cases they're producing it. Uh, so it's um, so we try not to like create a hard line between sort yeah. of applied and and lab or you know practitioner and and academic research. Um, but the, I think the big thing for us is that there is a different we've got different like pressures internally so mm -hmm. if you're on the academic side there is the pressure of publication um and if you're on the applied side there's the pressure of impact mm -hmm. um and so what that means is that when you're presented with a project and so even some of the academic researchers are working on projects with partners um but what they're thinking a little bit more about is what is interesting for academia, what's interesting for the field and important for the field, um, which might mean that what you're, what you are going for, what you're testing, you might be testing a mechanism um, that you're, you're basically wanting to see if it exists, even if you actually don't think it'll have as big of an effect as something else that you could do. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, you know, it could be something that would be so simple as like, if you want to really have a big impact, change the default here. Um, but, you know, for the academic side, like that's not particularly interesting. It's like, great, right. yep, defaults work. Um, but they might instead say, well, let's, you know, instead of changing the default, 
let's look at, you know, this other um, sort of more obscure mechanism uh, that we think will have a slight Im impact, that yeah. will have a slight improvement. And our goal is to see if this thing worked, not right. how many more people were we able to get to pay their water bill on time. Right. Right. Um, well, I think that's a pretty good place to wrap up. Um, all right. Well, <laughs> thanks, uh, Mariel, for chatting with us today. Um, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Check in next time. Thanks, Great. guys. Good. Yeah, thanks so much for joining Bye. us. Yeah, Mariel. thanks for having me, guys. Thank you for listening. That concludes this edition of Action Design Radio, hosted by Eric Johnson and Zarak Khan. All podcast episodes are available for download on SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Special thanks to Morgan Bortz for design. And as always, we would like to recognize Steve Wendell, founder of the Action Design Network. I am your producer and audio engineer, Zach Simon. For more cutting-edge behavioral science content, visit action-design.org. Once more, that is action-design.org. There, you can sign up for our newsletter and find an in-person event happening near you. We have chapters in over a dozen cities in the United States, plus Toronto. Also, on our website, you can find additional notes and links regarding the topics discussed in today's episode. Once again, thank you for tuning in, and we will see you again soon.